Good morning. It's Tuesday, April 7th. This is Tech Talk Today, episode 154. I couldn't believe it myself. I'm also having a hard time really believing that it's April. Maybe it's because of my rough start yesterday. Let me tell you. You ever have one of those mornings? I'll, I'll put it into context for you. Where you go out, it's cold, you get in your car, and it just, you know, fails to start. Just And you're like, oh, no. Now what am I going to do? This ruins literally all of my plans for the day. Come on, you son of a guy. Start, you son of a guy. And then, it, of course. You're screwed. Well, that was me when I got in yesterday and my main workstation, my main rig, the rig that I depend on, my temple was dead. It crashed. It wouldn't boot. ButterFS airs all up in this business. I'm going to give you the full story in today's Linux Unplugged. Needless to say, I was just caught flat-footed. And so, after a, after a long, excruciating night of reloading, I am here to tell you that it is time to do the tech news. And to help me get through that tech news is our mumble room. Time appropriate greetings, mumble room. Time appropriate hey. greetings. Hey, guys. Oh, my number one rig, you guys. Oh, my number one rig. Um, that's, I hate it when this happens. Hate it. And this happens. It happens from time to time. But, boy, this was my rock. My Oh, my rock. Uh, so, yeah, right now I've reloaded. And uh, so I started the thread in the Linux Action Show subreddit. And I was thinking, hey, let's all let's collaborate. Like when you reload, what are some of the first things you do? Now, my normal approach is I load up kind of just the bare minimums and then just add things as I need them. Uh, but I always have a few things I have to do, like get the latest GNOME, make sure I install like dash to dock, tweak dash to dock so that way it looks like a Unity launch bar. Um, I got to install the Infidelity fonts because, it's, you know, I'm not an animal. A handbrake, Rupad, uh, YouTube download, Chrome, Firefox, all that stuff always goes on. And then I was like, well, what else? Like, what else should I try? And so I put up the uh, I put up a thread in the Linux Action Show subreddit. I'll have it linked to the top of the uh, Tech Talk Today show notes. And then... Uh, today later in the so i'll go i'll go work i'm gonna be working on that this afternoon i'll tell you all the different things i did try how my setup ended up what happened what went wrong what i suspect went wrong and what i definitely definitely should have done differently uh that'll be in today's linux unplugged this afternoon but oh you know what does make me feel a little bit better have you guys all had a chance to catch uh, John Oliver's uh, episode on surveillance and uh more importantly his interview with Edward Snowden that was a good one Oh, yeah, it was great. Nice. Watched it last night. Yeah. Hilarious. Oh man, is this great? Wow, this I think, I think this is an example of some of the best television um, I have seen made in a long time. And I don't mean just like in terms of production quality, but I mean in terms of level of importance, level of research the host did, r- amount of risk the host took, and then the actual ability to ask him like legitimately good hard questions that are like questions that you could see Snowden was surprised were so hard hitting and weren't bullshit questions. They weren't like, are you helping terrorists? You know, there was like, did you read every single document? You didn't read every single document. Don't you think that's probably pretty important? And then when, when he mentioned that the New York Times uh, inadvertently released something, he said, isn't that kind of on you? Isn't that an F up on your part at the end of the day? I mean, I just thought I was pretty impressed with. The, and then he managed to relate the entire thing to dick pics, which is legitimately resonating with the public. And it all happens. And so this is why this is an important television. All of this happens in the context of comedy, keeping you laughing the entire time, the entire time. And it is timed right before the Patriot Act is renewed in June which is, as most of you probably are aware, a very, very, very important renewal. If the Patriot Act is renewed, as it stands today, essentially there are no civil liberties. There is no Fourth Amendment, literally. I mean, the Patriot Act is a monster. The person which John Oliver quotes in this episode who created the Patriot Act, the man who authored the Patriot Act, says he never intended for it to be used the way it is and that it is egregiously being abused. And he highlights all of this in a comedy show and does it so well. I just, oh, this is so, um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, I think there's portions of it on YouTube. I don't know if the entire, cause the entire episode is like a half hour or so long or more, but it was extremely good. And I really recommend if you can find it, unfiltered supporters will probably, they'll probably somehow end up with the entire thing if they can't get their hands on it. Cause I know I've heard from some of you outside the United States who are having a hard time watching it. I thought it was particularly good. Um, it was nothing really new, but, uh, what I liked more about it is, I think it gave the public another shot at discussing this a little more with um, much, much, much broader emphasis 
on the upstream collection of internet data and uh, the 702 provisions and those which I think are particularly uh, egregious that so far we have avoided in the public debate. Most of the public debate has been around metadata and phone metadata and where the phone records are stored. But I am way, 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 way more concerned about upstream collection. And, and this episode manages to highlight that right before the Patriot Act comes up. And the Patriot Act is really the vehicle that the NSA uses to totally take advantage of upstream collection and to work with companies like Google and Facebook and then make them shut up about it. So I, I, I'm just so impressed by what John Oliver did. So if you haven't had a chance, it'd be, it's really worth watching, even if you're not in the U.S. <clears throat> and there is a, also a discussion thread going on the Linux Action Show subreddit about that that I've linked in the show notes. All right. So what's, let's, what's oh, funny about what's uh, funny about that though is like the mainstream news media is slamming him. They're saying, "Oh, it's a comedy show. Don't pay attention to it." Kind of a vibe, and I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" Like uh, more people are paying attention to shows like this because you guys aren't covering the news, and I feel it's disingenuous upon from the news media when <laughs> they're saying, "Oh, these questions don't matter," because right. like. They're, they're, but you listen, and they're actually good questions. Two things come. Oh, they're very good questions. Uh, two. Th- I, I was. I was. I was uh, literally shocked uh, <laughs> about it. Um, and two things come to mind. Uh, number one, how the hell have you guys not been able to land this interview? If this comedian on HBO was, and he has a much smaller audience than nbc or cbs so how the hell was it why I, so something tells me they haven't tried and then uh, and then the second thing is, is that's the same thing they said about john stewart and, th- and then john stewart un- unquestionably became relevant in the, in the in the public discussion and i i think john oliver has just has just done that as well uh lexi you want or ixel you wanted to say something yeah, uh, talking about the mainstream news sort of dissing on it, there was a really great clip in the John Oliver bit where Andrea Mitchell is talking to a congresswoman yes. about this. Do you and remember I played that on Unfiltered? News. Oh, no, I didn't catch yeah, that. Yeah, I did. I, that might have been actually one of our Unfiltered intro clips the week that happened. Uh, it was actually very funny watching uh, his setup to that. A lot of those clips were were unfiltered. In fact, the clip that he used, the uh, George Stephanopoulos clip that he used to introduce uh, the entire thing, was the same clip that we used to introduce the entire thing way back in Unfilter. Um, pretty fascinating because uh, it shows you that if you if you followed Unfilter since that story broke, you really uh, it was it was so, it was like a lot of the stuff he highlighted were like the like some of like the the, the best bits from our NSA coverage. And uh, I I think going back now, the Unfilter show is going to be a really, really fascinating re-listen um, in a couple of years because those the, the, that, that those few months when it was just it was just uh, you know uh, drop after drop after drop of revelation, um, we just tore through all of it in that show and uh, and so watching his recap, I saw a lot of the clips we had played. It was it was pretty cool. Now something that's not so cool is when a uh, service that uh, seems like it has good potential. Uh, but reality just catches up with it. I don't know if you guys are familiar with service called OnLive. If you followed Jupiter Broadcasting and specifically some of my old shows that we don't do anymore, uh, you have heard me talk about OnLive since its inception. I was involved in its early beta program. And uh, OnLive was essentially a gaming console in the cloud. Uh, it was, uh, from afar, it, you would have a little console. It started first as PC software, and you would log into the online ser- OnLive service which was really just a streaming video service. So this was the UI when you logged in. And uh, you would have uh, different areas. Hey guys, I'm Hamster, and this is on live. My account activated today, and so I'm trying it out. So this is uh, ha- uh, GameSpawn's uh, YouTube clip of this. And in here you can see you have different games, sort of like a Steam game library. You can see games that people are playing, like their brag clips that people could capture and then post them online. Uh, and you would, uh, so theoretically, although I don't know if it was actually true, the uh, games in the background were people playing in real time. I, I, I don't know if that's the case or not, but the service actually worked pretty well for me. Uh, but there were sometimes latency with some things, and so I, I, I guess for some folks it, it was a real issue. And then when people tried to use over Wi-Fi, it was, it was a major disaster. The UI, though, for the time was pretty innovative, and the service was pretty innovative as well, right? It was going to do, essentially, remote GPU rendering and send it back to you with low latency. 
Uh, we've seen other people do this. NVIDIA does this, and now uh, Valve does this locally with Steam Streaming. OnLive was really kind of the first to try to do this, but it's going to close down. Uh, they're going to Great Capital C in the uh, clouds in the, <laughs> the Great Capital C cloud in the sky, uh, as this article puts it on April 30th. Yeah, all of the company's remaining patents have been sold off to Sony Computer Entertainment America. Presumably, Sony will use it for their PlayStation Now server, which, which, which is kind of similar. It's funny. Uh, essentially, their idea wasn't really wrong. NVIDIA is doing this. Play, uh, uh, the PlayStation Now service is doing this. Xbox does this to a degree, Xbox One. And uh, Valve is doing this to a degree. But OnLive just didn't quite get it right. And, it, you know, it was kind of it was a, it was a hard buy because you had to buy the titles on the OnLive service for full retail price. And they only worked on OnLive or you'd have to rent them. It was a difficult play. Anybody try OnLive? Nope, because it seemed like it was just more video rendering than actual like playing. And I think I think stream um, streaming really is taken off better now with um, Nvidia Shield. Yeah, um, the hardware is better. The ISPs yeah. are better. The whole infrastructure is better now too. And the uh, decoders and encoders are better. And the video codecs are better. Yeah. Also, like oh, how Valve does it, you can do it locally. Also, you know, I think um, Nvidia also has some. Uh, some technology called um, Grid, which might actually help companies with if they want to do that or do something else completely right. different. So it's right. Whereas OnLive had to had to build out their whole hardware infrastructure, and we're using some pretty advanced virtualization stuff to do this. I, I guess I, we need to summon Popey. I wonder if there's a way we could like if we all like looked in the mirror and said Popey three times over, because our next story is. It seems like I'm only allowed. I thought I only covered Bitcoin when Popey was around. Maybe he's listening. And just hasn't joined us. This story is a little frightening, uh, and it's not too surprising with the price of Bitcoin being down for so long. It looks like the Bitcoin Foundation is having some major financial troubles. Uh, you know, you're probably familiar with the Bitcoin Foundation. If you're not, it's sort of similar and modeled on the Linux Foundation, where they help pay for some of the core developers of Bitcoin, and they, you know, uh, do some of the uh, activism around Bitcoin. And they sometimes ha are. Um, there's some controversy around them, and uh, some people say they have a pretty bad reputation. Some people think they're pretty great. It just kind of depends on uh, you know the different camps you're in. Uh, but according to two board members, the foundation is very close to bankruptcy. It's not bankrupt yet, but maybe as soon as next month, potentially. The foundation has almost no money left and has um, sort of slimmed down, so that way they have cut down on extra programs and been able to and are focusing on funding developers. Uh, the money has essentially run out. Now, the Bitcoin Foundation has put out a fax about the Bitcoin Foundation. They say we are not bankrupt, we're, but we are in the process of working fast to uh, restructure and make a, strate a strategic plan, which they have proposed. They haven't laid off 90% of their staff like the news is reporting. Um, executive directors volunteered to go off payroll. He wasn't fired. Uh, and uh, they have publicly posted their, uh, their, pa their plan to uh, restructure, and it is dramatically bad. At the end of the year, the foundation faced some significant challenges. Poor reputation, declining memberships, failing, I'm sorry, falling Bitcoin prices. This is their own assessment. Very bad balance sheet. January 2014, they had $5.2 million. January 2015, 463000 Yeah. So they've made a lot of progress, but you can see they have been losing significant money. If you're watching the video version, we have a chart here that shows uh, revenue and net losses are declining. Revenue finally begins to climb, but operating expenses are also climbing at the same time. Donation. So, Chris, my spidey sense tells wow. me there's a Bitcoin story here. Wow. I, I, I had to come that on is, that, that is amazing. Good job, everybody. <laughs> Popey, the Bitcoin Foundation is going broke. What does that mean? Does that mean Bitcoin's done? Are we, should we sell our remaining Means. coins? Means all the greedy people are pulling their money out, just like every other Bitcoin venture. What would happen if the Linux Foundation goes bankrupt? Not that would ever happen, but what would happen then? I mean, that would be bad, right? Because because the, the the Bitcoin Foundation is paying for the core developers. That's why they they what, are they going to have to go get a job? How fancy that! Is, is Galvin Anderson or whatever his name going to have to go get a job? I mean, that's just, wow. I don't, I, I don't think the Linux Foundation would let that happen. I can totally, I could totally see a Bitcoin Foundation uh, running out of well funds, money, whatever you want to call it, yeah, or yeah. you know not not managing themselves financially well. I can totally see that coming yeah. a mile away. Not a threat for the Linux Foundation at all, but it just it's like wow, this seems like it's devastating if this goes through. But then again, maybe this is uh, now this is maybe maybe I could be just being optimistic here. 
but perhaps this is sort of like a flushing out like they're they're cleaning out like all of the greed and all of the like the the, the the bureaucracy that built up around Bitcoin, and now people are just going to get back to using Bitcoin to uh, sell things to each other over the internet and uh, buy drugs and. Uh, I think maybe I think maybe transfer not. money. I think it, I think some have been shaken out, and then some yeah, new people out. will come in. They'll get shaken out, and then after the apocalypse, then we'll be back to trading uh, Bitcoin properly the way it was supposed to be. So, in other words, uh, you're saying uh, hold for the long term. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Hold! All right, well, I'm very glad you were here, Poby. That's great Bitcoin insight uh, from somebody who uh, barely gives two craps about Bitcoin. I appreciate it. Exactly. That. If you ever, ever, <laughs> ever need my uh, expert analysis on Bitcoin, then you know, you know exactly where I am. I do. It's, it's a good rational uh, uh, take on it. Uh, oh, oh, okay. We do have one more story that you might have an opinion on. Uh, I just had to mention it in case people haven't noticed. Because, yes, people have been telling me constantly, I know there is a countdown over at elementary.io. Three days, 23 hours, 35 minutes, 28 seconds as we do the show. Does anybody want to speculate what it is? Hardware. Freya release. Oh, see, I always think of Freya release too. No, I reckon it's hardware. So uh, you saw the recent uh, Linux Mint box that went on sale yeah. and has sold out pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. And I know uh, Martin Winpress is doing deals for an Ubuntu Mate box of some kind. Mm -hmm. I totally think there's going to be some beautiful, clean um, device. Probably uh, the, the manufacturing may have been negotiated while the guys who work on elementary were working at System76 and part of the reason why one of them left System76 is because oh, he's now yeah. going to do hardware, yeah. which right, is uh, right. competing with System76, so can't do huh. that. So huh. I th I, that's my guess. <laughs> You nailed it. That's got to be it because you're right. Yeah, he did just leave System76. And everybody is doing hardware right now. Is this is this feel right, though? I mean, this isn't this just another form of too much choice? Now you have everybody's hardware and their own desktop. This is just getting a little confusing. It's great. I mean, you know, I would much rather have um, Linux Mint boxes, Ubuntu Mate boxes, and elementary boxes available to people than people buy Chromebooks, in my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah. As long as yeah, it doesn't I mean, go too far. It seems like it's potentially a slippery slope. That's all. I mean, look at uh, where we're at we're with um, internet ISPs right now. You barely have choice. I mean, it's really hard to find uh, a decent one in a big city yeah, that's, that's not yeah. Verizon, AT&T, or Time Warner Cable or Comcast, and any Maybe. mom and pop shop is gone. Maybe over there in the colonies, but uh, over here in Mother England, there's plenty of choice. Yeah. So, okay, uh, let's take this a step further. If it is hardware, what would we want from an elementary OS box? Is it a $300 t uh, tiny little quiet uh, sleek machine or is it something that is, you know, got some maybe like an i7 in it and an SSD? I'd, it? I'd say it was a laptop. I think it would be Ultrabook style, uh, you know, pretty macbook air macbook style laptop ah so not uh, like a nuck or anything no i don't think so because another clue is that the elementary guys recently added a feature called captive logon to allow you to use um captive portals so when you're in a coffee shop or at the airport or something and you know you open your web browser and rather than every browser tab getting redirected to the coffee shop login page mm. um mm. you get uh, a pop-up box that says hey you're not on the real internet you know log in here and then when that goes or you can use the internet and you you don't need that on a desktop pc why were they so keen to add that if yeah. there wasn't a mobile you know it would be coming? amazing you know it would be great is if they were teaming up with the purism guy That'd be kind of interesting. Hmm. That would be interesting, yes. But I would be surprised. I think yeah. I think they I think elementary value pretty over free software. Well, that that, 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 that that's, not, that's not disparaging. But that Librem fifteen yeah. is sort of a MacBook looker. Yeah, true. So yeah, maybe they've got something which is a similar kind of style, look and feel. Well, and the word is the uh, Librem OS. guys are working on a thirteen inch version too. Nice. Good yeah. luck to them. So maybe, I don't know what I'm just saying. Or, you know, also, if the person who previously worked at System76 was familiar with how System76 did it, they could just do exactly. that as well. Yeah. Yeah, that would probably be a more direct route, wouldn't it? 
interesting to speculate. Well, I guess we'll find out in a few days, won't we? Uh, all right. Well, uh, I got to say thank you, everybody. We hit 470 over on the Patreon. You guys are so awesome, and I hope you enjoyed the behind the scenes. I haven't seen a ton of feedback on the behind the scenes videos, but uh, uh, and of course, we didn't have one this weekend because we did it on Friday. Uh, but it, I liked posting it, so we'll probably do more of that. And there's other goodies we'll be posting there. And then when the crew comes in uh, uh, towards the end of the month, uh, I'm going to try to get a bunch of stuff up there. I'm hoping by then to have a phone with a much better camera, too. I just freaking hate the camera on this Nexus 5 these days, especially the front facing camera. It's like, come on, they couldn't have. Ugh. Anyways, if you're if you're taking a video and you're holding the phone and it sucks, I just I I, I have a thing. I, maybe I'm a crazy person, and I don't know what it is. But I just if it if I look at that video quality and I'm like, oh, it's the encoding sucks, or oh, the, I I just can't do it. I think that means I'm crazy. Anyways, I sh- I'm hoping on the tenth, my new phone ships. I have literally no idea. I'm just jumping in and I'm ordering it, but we'll see. This could be a disaster. But if it gets here. Then I'll have a nice front-facing camera. I think we'll have a great... Uh, uh, and then the back face. The back camera does 4K video. So I think we could have some really cool videos for uh, our patrons. So go over to patreon.com slash today. And that's where you can fund all of the future endeavors of the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. It helps us keep it a little weird. So that way we get a good balance of community funding and sponsorships that help do things like pay the hosts, pay me. And then the money we raise here for the Patreon helps us do things like launch new shows that don't have sponsors or replace a piece of hardware or fly a bunch of people in. And all you know. And we also do things to supplement at a cost as we can, like with Teespring campaigns, because we really believe that to keep Jupiter Broadcasting um, sort of the way it's always been for so long is to be really focused on the needs of our community. And I really prefer to hyper-serve you guys because I want you to keep listening and I really want you to tell more people about us. I don't really, I mean, I love sponsors that are great fits too, but the long-term relationship I need to build is with you. And that's what we're doing over at patreon.com slash today. And thank you to 470 of you. Hope you enjoy that. And also, tip of the hat to all of you who made it over to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. Well, 72 of you. Golly, I think we have ourselves an official long-term meetup page. <laughs> And uh, our first event is for Linux Fest Northwest, but I encourage you to sign up regardless of your locale, because as we do get to traveling, as we do, we'll have meetups, we'll coordinate here. So if we go to a fest somewhere, or I finally get out on the road, or I end up in Canada because Alan's convinced me to go to this crazy BSD hippie thing up there, I'll have a meetup up there, even if it's just something small, like at a, at a burger joint, you know, a few people, you'll know about it. So go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. And uh, our first event is Linux Fest Northwest. And I think uh, for those of you who signed up for that, we'll probably do things like here's our plans for the post show, et cetera, et cetera, or uh, the post after party. So that'll be a good resource for those of you going. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting with our first one being Linux Fest Northwest, but future ones may be a lot of them in the Seattle area. But uh, as we travel, they'll be out and about too. Okay, boom, wow. Bam, bam. We like we got into a groove there, you guys. And then it was just like rapid fire, rapid fire, rapid fire. So here we go. TechTalkToday.reddit.com is where you go to make this show even better. Uh, submit some stories. Give us a Kickstarter or two. Comment on things. Vote up or down. Go there. TechTalkToday.reddit.com. And uh, I think uh, we'll have a full... I don't think we have any... Oh, wait a minute. I don't know if there's going to be a Friday episode this week because I might be need I might need to clear out to uh, Women's Tech Radio. might be coming to do a big old batch of episodes. So I, I might, I'll, I'll let you know. But you can just keep up to date over at JupiterBroadcasting.com slash calendar. So... Uh, you're going to be there? You're going to be here in studio, Iamacon? Well, if you're, if you you know, by the way, hmm, I would like to have people in studio from time to time. So if you are in the area, let's see, I don't really want to have like a lot of people, but from time to time, I wouldn't mind having somebody come in uh, and uh, jump on the mic and uh, it'd be like the mumble room on the audio quality is better. And uh, that'd be fun. So uh, if you're considering it, hmm. Email Angela at JupiterBroadcasting.com. You knew I was going to say that. And also, remember, I also want to put a call out for anybody who wants to uh, do Creative Commons mu- music mixes that we could use and uh, maybe do a, uh, a, a music edition of uh, Tech Talk where I'll play some music from the community. And it will do a longer f- a format episode then. So if you're out there and you want to put together a couple of pieces for us, um, that'd be really cool. I don't think anybody has yet, and I put the call out on Friday. Not too surprising, I suppose. But if it's something that's up your alley, I'd love to play with it. And, uh, again, send that to Angela at jupiterbroadcasting.com. What? Yes, I know. I, I know. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? It's email's broken. Hey, all right, so that's it. Thank you, Mumble Room, for being here. Thank you, Chatroom, for being here. If you're not familiar with OnLive, well, good news. I'm sure this commercial will sell you on it. I figured 
it would be a good way to end the show is with a commercial that explains what on live is for those of you who had no idea what I was talking about. See you back here tomorrow, everybody. I love your faces. It's here. An all-new world no one ever thought possible that will change the game forever. The OnLive game system. Order now at OnLive.com. Just play.